All right, for mini lecture 3B, we'll be talking about amino acids and how I can use them as a chemist. When you look at those amino acids, some of them have unique chemical features that are very useful in the lab. That means that natural proteins are going to have those same unique chemical features. And as a protein chemist, I'm very interested in what can these proteins do from the 20 natural amino acids, the ones I don't need to like you know, add a chemical group to them. They've already got the chemical group that will do something cool. And so the one thing is, none of the amino acids by themselves are highly colored. They don't absorb in the visible range. However, there are two of them that are colored in the UV range, which means that a natural protein will absorb light in this range. Look at the UV range. Natural, uh, what you can see is going to be 400 to 700 nanometer wavelength light. This is going to be different. So what kind of light is this? If you look at this, um, tryptophan and tyrosine both absorb light, which would make them colored if you had eyes that could see, like um, pick which wavelength you would prefer to pick. You know, if you look at that, look at where the top wavelength is. For both of them, it's about maybe 275. Now, there's a slight difference from that that we actually do. We actually use 280 nanometers. And 280 nanometers is what I put into my spec. I, if we were in class, I would ask you, there's something else, not proteins, that absorbs light at 260 nanometers. And I would ask if anyone knows what it was, because you might have done this in the lab. So I want to ask you that. Have you ever measured absorbance at 260 for a biological sample? If you've ever measured DNA spectroscopically, you have used 260. And in fact, you can use a 260 to 280 ratio to determine how much DNA versus how much protein is in your sample. You gotta be a little careful because you look at this and tryptophan and tyrosine will still absorb at 260, but they absorb more at 275 and they absorb more distinctively, they're farther away from the DNA absorbance if we pick 280 and it's still very, very high. So if your protein has uh, tryptophans or tyrosines in it, then you can put it in a spec and you can measure it even without doing anything else to it. That's very powerful, and that means I can do chemistry on it. You actually will be doing this later in the lab. The other thing, if we look around, and oh, by the way, tyrosine and tryptophan, look at their structures. What do they have in common? In fact, if you can do it right now, pause and look at their structures, actually. Uh, and uh, so... I'll let you do that. If you've done that, now you should see that they both have ring structures with a lot of pi bonds. That number of pi bonds will actually absorb in the 200s. If you add a few more pi bonds onto it, you actually get something that will absorb in the visible wavelength. And so you can actually make colored molecules, but you have to stitch a bunch of rings together to be able to see something colored. And that's where you see many flower pigments are like that. So the other thing that you see, you see rings when you look at the, um, the uh, amino acids. You can also see that the cysteine is something uh, distinctive. If you look at methionine, methionine also has sulfur, but that's a sulfur with a methyl group on it. That's not going to do much of anything besides be larger, be a larger atom, and be, its electrons are a little more polarizable because it's larger. Uh, but cysteine, on the other hand, has a thiol group. It has a distinctive functional group that can do distinctive chemistry. Thiols are different from hydroxyls in chemistry. And if one of the things thiols can do that hydroxyls can't, they can bind each other. This is really cool. This means if I have two cysteines in a protein, that they can actually form a covalent bond. It's a weak covalent bond, but it's strong enough to be officially called a covalent bond, stronger than a mere hydrogen bond. And what happens is that you re remove two electrons and two protons because you have to balance the charge. Once those electrons are removed, the electrons that remain form a covalent bond between the sulfurs. Now, what is this called? You're removing electrons from something. And there's a term for that. Let me give you a hint. When you're adding electrons to it, electrons have negative charge. So in a sense, you're adding negative charge to it. That means you are reducing it. So the direction going to the left and breaking the cysteine-cysteine bond is going to be a reduction. 
what's the thing that's paired with reduction if you're going the other way, if you're taking electrons away rather than adding them? It's oxidation. And so removing electrons is oxidation. And removing hydrogens is actually also oxidation as well because you are removing the hydrogens and you're promoting a bond between two oxygen-like atoms. So that's another way to remember that the rightward direction is oxidation. The leftward direction is reduction. Um, this is actually very common. Uh, this is the way that life usually does oxidation reduction reactions. It will not just add or remove electrons, but it will also include protons because life doesn't really like charges changing too much on it. So the best way, to, if you're removing a charged electron, it's most neutral to sort of pair it with a charged proton and then to have them both go. That's happening in this case. This is how to recognize oxidation reduction or redox reactions in life. They look a little different than they did in organic chemistry or um, in inorganic chemistry for that matter. But that's very useful because now you have a covalent bond that you made from one of the 20 amino acids. You can just encode it in DNA and you don't necessarily need anything else to make that really tie a protein together. There are other covalent bonds but they are harder to make. Look at this one. This is kind of like if you have a lysine and a cysteine and you have a powerful enough oxidizing agent, like for example, oxygen that's applied in the right way, it can actually, the oxygen can actually form a bridge between the lysine and cysteine and make that NOS bridge you see on the right. If you reduce it, you can break that bond. So it's the same idea. Oxida oxidizing produces the bond, reducing breaks the bond. Um, it's just a less common situation because it's harder to make that bond. It's easier to make the disulfide bond that we have between two cysteines. This is not in your textbook. This is not common enough to be in a textbook, but I want you to see what the principle is because covalent bonds, chemists love to make them because they last, right? So I want to have a question for you. This, we've alluded to this, and you can pull out your amino acids and count them up. If I ask you, like on the test, how many of the 20 common amino acids have rings in their structures? Okay, you can look at them and count them up. I'm going to give you a chance. So pause it right now if you want to do it. Okay, you've got your answer. You can hold up your answer up on your number of fingers. Uh, you can do fingers and toes if you want to do all 20, but I can tell you it's less than 10. So hold up your fingers for how many have rings in them. And let me walk you through that. You have uh, the ones with pi bonded rings are phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and there is one other that I am thinking of, histidine, right? The imidazole ring, that's four. But actually, the advanced answer to this question is to have five. Notice specifically what I said. I said they have rings in their structures, not conjugated pi bond rings. All of the other four have pi bond rings, but there's a fifth one that has a ring that is not pi bonded at all. It's sort of crooked. It's made of tetrahedral carbons, and that one is proline. So if you look at how I word things very precisely, I will always stick to my precise words on the test. And sometimes you'll ask me, do you mean that word? And I'll say, yes, I mean that word on the test. I want you to read precisely, and I want you to answer precisely given that answer. Four is wrong. It would only be right if I said pi bonded rings in their structures. So notice that you can also get a feeling for how big or small amino acids are. This is important chemically. There, uh, there's a range of 75 to a little above 200 in terms of atomic units, grams per mole, right? Glycine and alanine, 75 must be glycine. Alanine's around 100. Most of the rest, arginine, tri tyrosine, tri and tryptophan are around 200. They're way at the other end of the scale. All of the rest are between 100 and 150. So you see you have sort of a Bell distribution. It's not a perfect distribution, but um, with only 20 units, it wouldn't be perfect. But you can see that most amino acids, if you have to calculate in your head what the molecular weight of a protein is, take the number of amino acids and multiply it by 100. 
and then round up a little bit because the average amino acid is going to be around 110 molecular weight. That's accounting for the distribution because some of the, um, and a, a, a real fast version of calculating that would be just taking 400 amino acids times 100 would be a 40,000 molecular weight protein. It would really be around uh, 4,400, 44,000, because we should be multiplying it by 110. But uh, you can be as precise as you need to be, and I'll always signal what level of precision I'm looking for. And that is how chemists will use amino acids. We have one more topic, and that's how we name amino acids coming up next.